so we're trying to make some sense out of this um, Maccabean problem. Then we're going to move on to Josephus. So um, I think we're getting to where we need to be. I think we're slowly getting into the subject. Don't be surprised. Maybe you don't think you're doing anything or anything's happening, but you're uh, penetrating a vast forest. And uh, so the more of this kind of information you start to uh, accumulate, the deeper you can get. My kid was telling me last night that he saw Mel Gibson's passion. He said it was a hundred times worse than he could have ever imagined. And uh, he said, you know, don't see it because uh, you will be so uh, horrified that you will not uh, be able to survive. That, he doesn't know me, I probably have a laugh. But um, the point being, Mel Gibson could have maybe used a bit of reading in his period uh, other than mystic from the 19th century. And uh, then he might not have uh, uh, made lurid, lurid scenes out of what never happened. And, uh, you know, wrote a work of fiction under the guise of uh, a religious document, which is full of uh, hatred, viciousness, and harm. And can only do harm to mankind. And my kid said it was worse than something Goebbels would have produced. And you really got to have a lot of hatred in you to prove something like that. Now that's not for people who see the inspiring things, but they're interested and they miss the other things, which is fair enough if you're interested. So. I told him not to tell me about it, so I wouldn't bore my classes with uh, a reaction when he started to tell me. Uh, I have to regurgitate tell my reaction to it. I don't want to get into a big argument or a discussion when I haven't seen it and I don't tend to see it, but I know the problem. And, uh, when you have things of Pontius Pilate's wife taking that seriously, that she liked Jesus and Pontius Pilate is looking for a reason and doesn't want to kill Jesus and all the Jews are trying to make him do it. And, Pontius Pilate's wife goes and meets Jesus' his mother and all this kind of rubbish that never happened, there's never a line even in the scripture to that effect. It's totally imaginary and uh, it's, uh, it's pro-Roman, anti-Jewish propaganda of the most um, vile kind because it produces holocausts. And, uh, so you know, he should be, but it's thought of the holocaust with the iron. But there are many people who like that movie because of their faith is reinforced. That's fair enough. I understand that, but he's just exploiting it. And uh, you know, doing things that are um, horrifyingly uh, uh, villainous because of the past history of what has happened as a result of some of these portraits being taken as fact. I won't go any further than that. I'll just leave it at that. I know the period people who like the movie do, do so with a good spirit, and it's not their fault. Someone is. But, uh, someone is exploiting him, but uh, I can imagine the effect that has in places that people don't know anything about these things, in, in India or in Malaysia or in Indonesia or in uh, Arab countries or in African countries where they take this as factual. The um, stereotypes and the uh, incitement take probably another three or four hundred years to get over that because they're going to trot this movie out every Easter for the next 50 years because they don't have anything to play on TV anyway. That's a really sad uh, to my mind that someone would be so ignorant of the results of modern scholarship, so totally ignorant. And also to make an event even far more bloody and uh, uh, brutal. In any case, uh, I don't want any more about that. Uh, he got me, he should have told me about the movie because I had already forgotten about it. But, leave that as it may, uh, the reason I bring it up is because if someone had read Josephus and had done the Maccabee books, they could never make a portrayal of that kind. Uh, that's the sad thing. Um, let's go back to our portrait of the uh, Hasidans. If you recall that we uh, so two different groups of Hasidans, one in Maccabees 1, one in Maccabees 2. The one in Maccabees 1, um, one in Maccabees 1 
shows a odd sort of group which is split personality because that, as they're first introduced we hear that each one a stout uh, fighting man on the side of the law and the next thing we know they're they're uh, crumbling under the pressure of some seleucid um, uh, blandishments from a, a person who's gotten the high priesthood from uh, political machinations at the seleucid uh, court which is in um, antioch which is uh, present day syria i'm not sure the town <coughs> I'm not sure the town even exists anymore because um, the coastline has come in more, but uh, in Syria it's called Antakia, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's nearer on the coastline, and I'm not sure um, what the situation of that particular town is today, but it's uh, up near where Turkey is as the Mediterranean bends around. So, um, uh, this priest who in Maccabees 7, 1 Maccabees 7, Alchemus called a godless wretch here in 7, 9. Um, and the first among the Israelites who asked for peace terms were the Hasidians. And there's something wrong there. And um, how can they be two kinds of Hasidians, particularly when we uh, look at Maccabees 2, and we find out that uh, the Maccabeans were the followers of Judas Maccabee par excellence. And in the same discussions in Maccabees 2, at the end of Maccabees 2, we hear Alchemus telling the uh, Seleucid authorities that uh, the country will never settle down as long as these, these people are allowed to um, uh, function. And um, it's sort of like in Iraq today, like uh, he's describing a situation like Fallujah. You know, we can't have the Al-Qaeda and all these other groups in Fallujah. We have to suppress them. Uh, Judas Maccabee is the, you know, if you like, the leaders of the Fallujah resistance, if you like. And uh, so, you know, so I don't know if you could have, it's possible that this could happen, but we have two opposite portrayals. And I've tried to reconcile that as Ron and others know from previous classes and having read some of my work, some of you others have heard me speak about this now. Um, and the Pharisees are not mentioned in this book. The Sadducees are not mentioned in either of these books. They're just forming. And uh, what I have uh, finally uh, um, concluded from this is this is actually the birth moment of the Pharisee part. Because if you look at uh, Pharisees and hear uh, people speak about Pharisees, if you actually listen to rabbis speak about Pharisees, uh, contemporary rabbis, rabbis who uh, com consider themselves the inheritors of the Pharisee position. If you um, hear them speak about Pharisees, they, claim, they seem to think Pharisees come from Hasidians too. And uh, certainly we would assume at some point when we talk about Essenes, Josephus, uh, if you've been reading him at all, or get into him, you'll see he speaks about at least three groups of, of Jewish parties or sects or uh, I don't know what you call them. In any case, you have the uh, Pharisees and all these groups get into the New Testament, you see, which is obviously picturing a later period. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss if it's reliable or not. I don't think it is completely, somewhat. Uh, and I'm not saying that because of the antagonism I feel about these things. Uh, I say it because I really don't think it is reliable uh, on these matters somewhat because the New Testament is using a code. Um, sometimes it means by Pharisees, real Pharisees. Sometimes it means nitpickers. Sometimes it means uh, people within the early Christian movement itself who act like Pharisees. And when Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels as attacking the Pharisees, he may be attacking real Pharisees, or the Pharisees are attacking him, or he may be attacking the groups within the early Christian movement who uh, insisted on uh, following the law rather than the Pauline approach. And I think most of the time, Jesus is attacking.
attacking the Pharisees or portrayed as attacking Pharisees. And most people don't understand that about historical documents. Certainly the individual I mentioned hasn't got a clue about that. Uh, historical documents from this period often are using, like Socratic dialogues do and other literature of that kind, are using uh, groups for mouthpieces of polemical argumentation. So just the way Plato uses Socrates and then Socrates uses uh, various students to uh, be a mouthpiece for a certain position so that Plato or Socrates can finally win the argument and propagate their doctrine. And we don't know if those arguments really ever happened or if Plato is just setting up a straw man. Most of the time I think maybe a a small kernel might have triggered his uh, interest in that particular problem and then he goes on and develops his whole position with this straw man uh, idea. If you've never read Plato, it's unfortunate. Uh, you're at the university and um, probably uh, the, the course, uh, University 101, instead of taking you around the campus and looking at the building, <laughs> should probably <laughs> teach you Plato. Uh, you know, I mean, it's his, uh, this is it, this is a pathetic way to introduce people to a university, as if you're coming to a kindergarten. Uh, so I mean, you, you don't need University 100 or 101, whatever it's called. You know, you need the basis of Western civilization, and, and one of the bases is that you should be proud of knowing. And unless someone forces you to read it, you won't read it. So if you're forced to read it, so you'll read a few dialogues by Plato, and then you'll see the basis of Western intellectual history. And then you'll be frightened of it either, because once you see there's nothing in it, and uh, it's easy, and you don't have to be afraid of it, you gain more confidence. If you are still uh, haven't put your foot in the swimming pool or the cold water, and you think it's too cold for you or too frightening, then on your own you probably never will. So it's a good idea to um, to have these introductory courses. But the first thing I think I would introduce you to, if I were making all students in the university take something, I think we would read a platonic dialogue. How many people have read a platonic dialogue? You would agree, I think, probably having read one. I mean, it doesn't mean you've learned a huge amount from reading it, but a style, uh, what he's up to, uh, you know, what is going on there, it's the basis of all Western intellectual history. It's also the basis of what law is. I mean, all legal training in the United States and almost everywhere else is based on the method that Socrates and Plato are using in those dialogues. And this is the, the way lawyers uh, approach a case through question and answer and eliciting information. So it's tremendously, uh, yeah. it's incredibly uh, good legal training. And it also um, uh, explodes the myths so that this is not frightening. It's something that you can understand. It's not something that's beyond your, your abilities. And it gives you confidence. Even policemen should take it. I mean, it would give them confidence in their intellectual ability. Therefore, they wouldn't be any intellectual firemen should take it. Street sweepers, everybody, so that they can feel that they're not, you know, they don't have to be pandered to by George Bush saying nuclear. They, they can demand that he say, at least say nuclear, but he doesn't say that because he knows people like the fact that he doesn't uh, pronounce it properly. You know, they, they, they like this anti intellectual. And I'm not against Bush, but you know I know what he's doing. In any case, um, so Pharisees in that picture is not it, 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 uh, probably not historical. The interesting thing is there's one party not mentioned in the picture we're most familiar with, the Gospels. Uh, that's more or less what everyone knows about this period. Uh, one party isn't mentioned that Josephus is very interested in the Essenes, and I think the reason is pretty much obvious. Because the people who the Gospels are trying to portray are the Essenes. In other words, you mean Christians are Essenes? No, I would say Essenes were what Christians, early Christians were in Palestine. Since there was no Christianity in Palestine, and I don't think the Gospels ever claim that there's a Christianity, because there's no Christianity even as far as the Gospels go, until after Christ is dead and resurrected. So the people that are on Christ's side, if you like, Jesus' side, or whoever you want to refer to them as, uh, are of a given party. They're not Pharisees, they're not Sadducees. Well, what are they? You know, they're something else. They're not just malcontents. So 
There's a fourth party Josephus we'll talk about called the Zealots. And we've already been seeing here that we have some proto-Zealot material in the Maccabee books. And I've showed you already the Phineas issue in the speeches of Mattathias. So, uh, so and uh, one or several of Jesus' associates, even in the picture in the Gospels, and it's a picture only, um, are called zealots. We have one, uh, one apostle who is uh, referred to as a zealot. Uh, other ones camouflage it because it worries them. And I've told you that they call this apostle a Canaanite or a Canaanite. Well, there were no Canaanites there, and as I told you last time, I think, Cana is the Hebrew word for zeal. So it's just a, miscon it's a mistransliteration into Greek of a Hebrew term, Canaim. And the people doing the Greek either did it purposefully or just didn't understand that the Canaim are the zealots, the people who have zeal. Im is a Hebrew plural. And then Judas Iscariot is quite likely a uh, and the reason he's portrayed negatively is because the authors of that document, or those documents, uh, uh, don't like the position that he is to a uh, person who understands the prayer is supposed to represent a Sicari, or a Sicarius, a, a person who is a uh, uh, terrorist, or a, uh, by his opponents he would be called a terrorist, but uh, a knife person. Uh, I don't think that's what they were. Uh, again, that's a misnomer of Josephus' voice on us because Josephus is pandering to the Romans too. The problem is, as we'll see, that everyone wants to survive in the Roman world, and therefore in order to survive in a brutal world such as the one the Romans uh, began, to, began to become in the first century, with leaders like uh, Tiberius, Caligula, uh, Nero, and Domitian, all first century emperors who were totally brutal. Uh, and their uh, freed um, uh, satraps who they sent out to uh, uh, exploit these territories that they had conquered. Um, these, um, these emperors and these, uh, these officials and so on had to be um, conciliated. Comedy. So to do that, uh, you have to portray certain things negatively that they wouldn't like. And one of the things, of course, they don't like would be this Sicari movement. And uh, that's another movement. So we have two other movements, not one of the three, but are probably versions of the same thing. And in fact, Josephus does tell us that these two groups want just a little more extreme than the other, perhaps. Though they're both part of the same movement. So both of them are to be found in Jesus' entourage, probably. I say probably. So Jesus' group would be a combination of Essenes, if, if it existed as such. Jesus' group would be a combination of Essenes, Zealots, Sikhar. And uh, that's what I mean. If we're making a real movie about the Spirit, we'd have to start studying this history. Again, not visions of uh, 19th century insane women. Um, maybe Jesus should have um, done what he did to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven demons. Maybe he should have done some demon casting out of these 19th century people, too. Might have been. But they were just beatified by the Pope a couple of days ago, so the Pope wants to cash in on the movie. But anyway, to, uh, to get back to uh, the parties, and the Hasidans, which is where we began. I know you thought I'd never get back. So certainly, the Pharisees feel they're descended from Hasidans. If they are, they're descended from these Hasidans here. Now the literature we read, Daniel and uh, Enoch, which is similar to Daniel, but we didn't read it, but it has the same spirit and uh, you know uh, style. It's a, what we call apocalyptic literature and some other similar texts of that kind that didn't get into the Old Testament canon as we have it before us. Um, I think this literature probably has to be called Hasidian literature. The literature of the Hasidian movement. 
That is a very zealous, apocalyptic minded, uh, final war against all evil on the earth oriented. Uh, certainly uncompromising to an extreme degree. I mean, this literature is never going to uh, claim that uh, Caesar is the Messiah that came out of Palestine, which the Pharisee, uh, uh, which the Pharisees were willing to do, and people like Josephus were willing to do. So this is a very aggressive uh, literature, very nationalistic literature, and a very xenophobic literature, and uh, uncompromising. I think I've used all the adjectives I need to use. And so, uh, and the scrolls are, are that. And anyone who, I've just been reading the war scroll because I've been writing about it today, and it's just a shockingly uncompromising and uh, uh, zealous, and it believes in a final war against all evil, and there is nothing peaceful in it. it a, I don't say that it's wrong because it's aggressive. It feels it's aggressive on the side of righteousness and, and so on, but it is totally, an aggressive uh, piece of literature. I uh, was reading one of the uh, one of the passages for uh, one of the quotations I was doing. It, it actually frightened me. It was so aggressive. Uh, so, and anyone who thinks we have before us in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I don't know where people come up with such an absurd idea, uh, a peaceful essence has got to be living in an alternate universe. I mean, he, that means they're not reading the, the documents with any understanding. And they're just uh, you know mouthing the words and uh, going according to some preconception that they have about Essenes. But if they want to call the scrolls Essenes, then they're not certainly peaceful. So what are they? Uh, they're, they're probably a combination of, 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 of these groups here. But these are the three groups Josephus mentions officially. And these ones he also mentions unofficially or, or, or um, in an aside in both his works. In the antiquities, he's more forthcoming about these two groups as he is usually about everything else in the antiquities than he is in the war. He mentions these groups, but says he's going to tell us about this group, but then doesn't. So, um, you'll read the war. I hope you're starting, starting to read it. We don't have time to read the antiquities. So we're here. The birth moment of the Pharisee party. Why? Let's assume that the Hasidians are the authors of this literature. And let's also therefore assume that the literature is around, uh, 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 is uh, functioning around the idea of resurrection of the dead. Which of course the New Testament, as you know from the discussions in it and what you may have heard about it and what you've seen, is also interested in the idea of the resurrection of the dead. It's so interested in the resurrection of the dead that it actually claims it's got a leader who was resurrected from the dead. In case you had any doubts about the doctrine, we've got the very person here. And uh, we saw him after he died. And uh, that's basically what Paul says. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I think it's in Galatians or Romans, I am no Christian. And um, First Corinthians is it all right. I'll take your correction. In any case, he says similar things in all those three letters which are the major letters. So, I mean, that, that is the essence of his faith, a victory over death, death be not proud. That's not what Palestinian religion was about. You see. Yeah, Palestinian religion was about law, justice, and righteousness. Nothing to do with victory over death or anything like that. That's what Greek mystery religion was about. And it, it's very difficult for people to comprehend that because they just don't understand the Palestinian religion because they haven't read the document. So well, what's where this doctrine of resurrection of the dead come from? Why, 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 why is it being used? Well, I think mostly it's being used as a goad for holy war, like the Muslims use it. And the Muslims, I think, have inherited it from these uh, documents before us, fortunately or unfortunately. I, I don't think it's been used very healthily by them in recent times. Kind of gotten haywire. I mean, now they crash planes into buildings. Uh, and kill all of the uh, people on the airplane and burn everyone up and don't even feel a jot of compassion or guilt because they're going to be holy warriors resurrected from the dead. I mean, this is, you know, a pathetic uh, uh, misuse of the doctrine, but that's what it's come to when you have unthinking maniacs take hold of it. I don't think the scrolls were like that, and I don't think these uh, 
Palestinian uh, ideology was like that. This went haywire when it got into the Quran. Now, I'm on my own film here, but you know, I think Muhammad is insane. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for that because um, there are a lot of insane people running around. I don't think that's a necessarily an insult. Uh, he's a very good poet, and I think Islam is greater than the Prophet because culturally Islam developed a huge, rich culture. And uh, just because the person who was involved in the uh, founding of it has a kind of uh, streak in him that's absolutely irrational, put it put that way, uh, doesn't mean that Muslims are that way, uh, except if they take it too seriously, which is what's happening to people crashing into buildings, they are taking it too seriously. But the Islamic culture and society and religion is not that. So um, anyway, I take that back. Uh, I don't want people to go out and say that, that I said that because uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, that's a private comment. Um, how should I put it? It's a private comment meant for, meant for personal use only, <laughs> not for public consumption. Okay? But what I'm trying to say, the reason I said that was because of the misuse of the martyrdom doctrine that people are that people have, have uh, done, yeah. What about the second Maccabees story we'll about get to that. those? We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. I'm going to get to that. Uh, that's what we're going to come into. Um, those people, anyway, are not killing other people. They're being killed, the story about right. the seven brothers. Yeah. They're, they're suffering. They're, they're suffering oh, evil. Yeah. They're not handing out evil on the face. That's what I'm trying to talk about, but I'll get to it. Yeah, that's the whole point. Those those guys are not going to go crash into buildings and bring down, you know, and blow up airplanes and kill 3,000 people and think that uh, this is a noble act. Uh, I don't think that they're they're they're, they're uh, willing to. They're uh, they are the forerunners of Christian martyrdom, is what they are. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. In any case. Um, so the resurrection of the dead is the one of the new ideas coming in with this Hasidian literature. We saw it come in with Daniel. That's the first place we really saw it. And that's what's coming in. And that's to inspire the, the freedom fighters. And like you say, in Maccabees 2, that's how it's being used, to inspire martyrdom. And uh, to inspire you know, people who are willing to give up their lives for, you know, for this struggle. Uh, but I think it's supposed to be righteous. Well, not just for their faith. The faith should be righteous in Palestine, somewhere else. I mean, you're going to have faith in anything. I mean, I could have faith in um, uh, Kali, and then I'd go around like, uh, I hate to use the English word thug, but the English coined the word thug because of the revolt in India in the 19th century where the thugs, we call them thugs now, but the thugs were going around killing travelers on, on the road. Uh, because of uh, the Kali cult, which was a death cult. I don't know if you're familiar with that. How many have heard of that? Uh, yeah, it was a cult in India at that time called the Tugs, the Thugs. So yeah, I mean, faith isn't sufficient uh, to curb this. Faith may be sufficient for some people to live by, but it isn't sufficient to curb this kind of uh, willingness to do these horrendous things. There has to be some righteousness or justice, which I think was always, I'm not giving the Hebrews undue credit, I think that was always uh, their chief focus. Maybe they all weren't that way, but that's what they were interested in. Again, which is why portrayal in the movie is so ludicrous. Again, I wish my kid hadn't told me about this movie. Uh, but because I purposely didn't see it. But uh, in any event, um, righteousness had to be part of it. He told me the portrayal of the priests and the rabbis and everybody was just horrendous. I believe it. Uh, but uh, they're made to look hard too. Um, and they're always screaming for blood as well, which is ridiculous. If anyone is brutalizing people in his prayers will see it, they'll see this. It's the Romans. So, anyway, um, resurrection of the dead. So the Hasidians, or rather the Pharisees, say, well, as Josephus describes the sects, that the Pharisees differ from the Sadducees in that they believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the New Testament picks that idea up in, in Acts and other places where it has the Pharisees and Sadducees arguing over the doctrine of resurrection of the, of the dead. And that's clearly probably uh, derived from Josephus. And those would be portraits probably where Josephus came before 
the account in the uh, scripture that you have because the authors have read their Josephus and they know one thing about the Pharisees and Sadducees, that they differed over the matter of resurrection of the dead, and that's right out of the Jewish war. Because Josephus doesn't tell much more about their differences except that. And that's therefore what goes into the picture. If you want to really get a good picture of the difference of Sadducees and the Pharisees, read the whole Talmud, which is a literature of about 30 volumes or so, and you know it goes into excruciating detail. So uh, the difference of Pharisees and Sadducees was not just about one superficial <coughs> matter, the resurrection of the dead. That's just like a cartoon version of, this, of, of what the difference but that's what people who read Josephus would know, and therefore that's what they would think. And that's what the Gospels and the Book of Acts presents the difference as being. There we say. And the Pharisees who believed in resurrection of the dead said this, and the Sadducees who denied the resurrection of the dead said this. I'm sure you've seen that in about three or four different places in the scripture as we know. And that's right from Josephus. All right. Uh, so. And of course, a, a person of faith or, or belief shouldn't be upset or worried because a person of faith or belief would not be expected to know this. How would you know this if you're presented with a literature and you've never read another literature that has more detail to it so that you can compare? And then you're told to accept everything that you do on faith because if you don't, you might burn in hell. So if you have that situation presented to you as a very young person, you, you, you can't be uh, blamed for not knowing these things. How could you possibly know them uh, unless someone uh, was brave enough to introduce you to it? And nobody mostly in that environment is going to be that brave. So uh, you, you shouldn't blame anyone and you shouldn't blame yourself. It's just the way the world works. But once you do read these things, you can make some assessments. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so the Hasidians bring in, I think, through this literature, like Daniel and other works like that, the not doctrine of resurrection of the dead. So these Hasidans are compromising Hasidans, and that will be a, 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 a consistent pattern of the Pharisees down to the war against Rome and afterwards. So that's why I call this group of Hasidans who go into Pharisees, that's why I call them Pharisees. Pharisaicosidans, whatever. This is not the more extreme, what I would call purest Hasidans, or people who, who are not willing to compromise with foreign power, which is what the what, what the issue here. You can see in this episode, you say, well, you're making a big deal of this episode. Yeah, because it's illustrative of the whole period. Look at your book. What do you have in front of you? What's going on here? These people are willing to live with a priest appointed by foreign governments. That's what it's all about. They are, the other group are not willing to live with a priest appointed by foreign governments. How do I know that? The Mathathias type of Hasidan or insurrectionist or zealot, whatever you want to call them, they are different names according to the observer, they go by the zeal of Phineas. Whoever uh, displays the zeal of Phineas, he's the high priest. It doesn't matter what the Seleucids said, or what the Roman governor said, or what the Herodians said, or what the Roman emperor says. It's zeal that decides who's the high priest. This is what Bin Laden would probably say today, even though I don't agree with Bin Laden in the Islamic world. I don't know. Him, I don't know how corrupt he is or how not corrupt he is. It seems quite insane to me. But uh, you know, uh, this would be, I'm sure, he's, it's the unbelievers, the Americans, the Westerners, if they try to tell us what kind of government, what kind of you know Islam we should have, we have to reject that. But does he reject the Saudi oil money? I'm not sure. I doubt it. So you know, uh, there, there, there's an Achilles heel there. Uh, is he interested in pure righteousness? It doesn't look like he is to me. So even though he's got xenophobia as far as the non-Islamic world and wants to stay in the Middle Ages, he wants medieval Islam to uh, be uh, uh, to continue. He doesn't want to accept the modern world, but he's really fighting against the modern world. That's really what his what his issue is. And he uses the Islam, the uh, martyrdom ethic in Islam, to further that struggle. So let's go back here then. 
So how do I know these other groups wouldn't do this? Because we see they don't do this. They hold out. They resist. They don't accept alchemists. Does this book accept alchemists? No, it calls him a godless wretch. So this group, there has to be a group that this literature represents. You follow me? I don't have it spelled out in black and white. I have to look at the literature and intuit it. So to intuit what this group is, I use my hand and my insight. And I realize that this is a zealot type of group. An extremist group. Call it what you will. So in my book, Back of the Zadokai's Christians and Qumran, and I please pray say, a, a, a your development there, Maccabees to the Zanakites to the Christians and the Qumran documents. I say that there are two groups of, uh, of uh, Hasidim. One, Pharisee Hasidim. That's why I say this is the birth moment of the Pharisee. Yeah, I can't prove it. But I think it's better a description than anyone else. It doesn't even make, try to make any sense out of this contradiction. Contradictions are great because through contradiction you can often, in fact, develop insight. When you see people are contradicting themselves on a given event, then you see that there may be something that you can derive. I don't say that's what they were called, but let's call them that. And the other group, I would say, could be called Zadokite Hasidim. How, why Zadokite? Because Zadokite would be something the scrolls would be interested in, the Sadducees would be interested in, because this word and this word, this is just a Greek transliteration of this word. They say, well, they don't like the Sadducees in the New Testament. No, 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 because these Sadducees, or these Zadokites, which is why we don't use the same word, have already been wiped out by Herod. So by the time you get the New Testament, you get new Sadducees who are just like these guys here, who are willing to accept the high priesthood on appointment from foreign power. So, the, 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 I know it's hard. Now, how could you explain this to someone who has no background? How would you take your little sister or brother who's going to a church or a synagogue or some school like that, or your uh, mother or your, uh, you know, someone in your family or something, tell them about this? They'd look at you like you were insane. You know, you cannot give these complex ideas to the uh, average person and yet they need to know them in order to understand what kind of Sadducees are these in the New Testament. Yet it doesn't take me long, once I get you into the literature, to explain these points to you. Because once you see the books, once you read some of the documents, then it becomes clear to you that this can be. So, right away, I can explain the Sadducees in, in the New Testament, can I? Because the Sadducees in, in the New Testament are a later group of Sadducees that developed later, still claim genealogical descent from Zadok. Who do we say Zadok was? David's high priest, Solomon, of David Solomon the first time. Still claim descent from that individual, but don't make any other claims. Nothing about righteousness, nothing about resistance, nothing about zeal. Nothing about uh, xenophobia, nothing about not accepting impure uh, per, uh, appointments or anything like that. So when did they develop? Well, we won't see it here. Where will we see when they develop? From Josephus. When you read Josephus, you'll see when that group starts to develop. We're not at that stage yet. We're at a much earlier stage. Is that clear? So, um, Here we have then, and I don't say these people are really called Sadakai Hasidim, but for lack of a better word, we can call them. We can also call them Essene Hasidim. If anyone knew what the term Essene meant, but nobody does know what the term Essene meant. I mean, at one point I think either Philo or I think Philo, the uh, philosopher in Alexandria who precedes Josephus a bit and is uh, the father of Neoplatonic philosophy to some extent as we know it. He was a Jewish philosopher in Alexandria in the earlier part of the first century than Josephus from a very wealthy family in Alexandria. So he was upper class 
and I think he does say that Essene means pious ones. Well, if Essene means pious ones, that's what this means. Hasidan is the Hebrew word for pious one. Hasid means pious one. Okay? Any question about that? Okay. But also, this means righteous one taken in its root meaning, not in its normative meaning. You follow what I mean? If you just take it in its normal meaning, it means uh, descendant of Zedok. But if you look at the letters, ZDK, then you'll know ZDK in Hebrew means what? Righteousness. So you can also say, forget all this. Just look at ZDK, and this is a righteous, righteous hospital. So they're making a claim for righteousness for the priesthood at this point. Genealogical descent plus righteousness. What's the claim in the book of letter to the Hebrews? Melchizedek. But what's the claim there? A priesthood of righteousness. Perfect righteousness. That's the claim. And Melchizedek is in Hebrew king of righteousness. Melchi, as we think said last time, if we didn't, we're saying it this time. Melech means king in Hebrew. Zedek means righteousness. You say Melchizedek because we have a Greek transliteration. But the Hebrew would be Melech or when it's, you know, compressed, becomes Melchi, Zedek. Then in Greek it becomes a Greek transliteration of Melchizedek. Melchi Zedek is what? I just told you. King of righteousness. So that's a priesthood again. Playing with the word righteousness. And Jesus, of course, is the king of righteousness, if you want to look at it in that way. So, um, a righteous king, if you prefer. So, this is a variation on this. This is wordplay now. We're not sophisticated enough in Hebrew that we could understand wordplay, but one is a variation of the other. So, um, the Christians, to my mind, are also coming out of these groups. As they go down into the next centuries and out the pipeline to the greater Mediterranean world, if you want. Like. And as they become colonized, they turn into something entirely different. You say, well, didn't Jesus produce it? That's the big question that we have raised before. I want to keep harping on it. You'll have to decide that for yourself, but um, I don't be, I think the evidence shows that Jesus regulated these matters. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have had to. And uh, the others don't seem to know Paul's teaching. They've never heard these ideas before. So that, to me, is good evidence that whatever Jesus did or didn't do or represent or didn't represent, he didn't know these kind of ideas about, uh, I mean, how can Christ say uh, things that... Uh, are attributed to him, something like, uh, believe on me and you will be saved. I mean, that's how he's portrayed as speaking, but usually people will say, oh, if you believe on that person there, you'll be saved. That's what a teacher does about a third party. It's very, very, if I come in and say to you, believe on me and you'll be saved, you're going to throw me out of the classroom. I mean, you're not going to accept that. <coughs> you say, well, that's why he did all these miracles. Well, that's why he's portrayed as doing all these miracles, but we can't, we can't really... Uh, sure that supernatural things are uh, possible in this universe. And that's another thing, that's a literary matter you'll have to decide for yourself. But the point being, it's very egocentric to say some of those things. It's usually what people say about another person. So when Paul is preaching in the Mediterranean, he can say, well, you know, Jesus that did, did these things. If you believe on him, you, you, you will be saved. So, well, how come he's portrayed as saying it? Ah, because then the writer retrospectively, when he's trying to recreate the history, can put that into the teacher's mouth a priori. 
but it wouldn't work normally, except if the guy were like, I don't know, if he were like, um, oh, of course, that's how he's portrayed, but if he were like um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, but uh, eternal, an eternal Arnold Schwarzenegger, I suppose people might listen to him say such things. But not a flesh and blood, blood human being with the normal uh, appearance of a human being and the weaknesses and characteristics with blood and bleeds and things like that. No, people wouldn't listen to most normal human beings. Say those things. Hey, anyway, you think about it. So, uh, but I think the Christians do come from these groups. So let's go back. Two groups then. So as time went on, as time went on, this part of the terminology disappeared. Pharisee in Hebrew means to split away, break away from. And I think what they did is they broke away from this part, from this group here, on the point of, of right here, appointment, foreign appointment of high priests. They were willing to accept the high priest from the hand of foreigners. And you see, that'll take us right down into the first century with the Herodian appointment of high priests, with the Roman governors appointing high priests and so on, with a, uh, a whole number of priestly families. But at this point, that hasn't been, that hasn't been clear. And we have a big nationalist movement going on here with the Maccabeans who have appointed themselves high priests, and uh, they're not accepting any high priests from foreigners usually. Now, I think one of the reasons probably that Maccabees won has a less than enthusiastic view of Judas than Maccabees too. And the reason Maccabees won tries to portray the Hasidans maybe in a bad light ultimately is because maybe other brothers of Judas were accepting appointment as high priests from Seleucians. We get some indication that Judas's other brothers who finally succeed him, Jonathan and Simon, are involved with the Seleucid authorities. Maybe they're not as um, aggressive as Seleucid authorities by the time they're uh, they're working with them. And I think there's some indication that uh, Jonathan and Simon, even though Jonathan meets his death through um, dastardly behavior, there's some indication that they are accepting things from the Seleucid authorities, where Judas doesn't, there's no indication that he was. So maybe that's why Maccabees II leaves off with Judas. Maccabees II doesn't want any compromise. Maccabees II doesn't want any boulderization, any, any, any diminution of the purity of the movement. But Maccabees I is interested in the Maccabean family first. It's not interested so much in the movement. Does that make any sense? Anyway, that's how I understand the reason for the negative portrayal of the Hasidians here, who we know are Judas' followers. Because as I told you last time, from whose point of view is Maccabees I written? Yeah, but who? What individual? Who's the one who survives in the end? Who's the last Maccabean brother who's not killed? Simon Maccabee. And then who gets acclaimed by the people ultimately, the high priesthood and so on? Simon. And then who's Simon's son? John Hyrcanus, and he's the one at the end of Maccabees 1. It'll be from his point of view that Maccabees 1 is put together. It's the history down to John, and therefore John sponsored the history. You got it? You say, how do you know that? Well, you got to use some common sense. You know, you don't know it. It's not written anywhere. You got to, that's where you start to use your brain and figure it out, if you like doing that. Some people don't like doing that. Some people prefer going to football games. Some people would rather watch, um, what's the thing when they spin the wheel and then they uh, pick a question or something, huh? You know, some people, some people like those quiz shows or something. Now for, for the double your money, you can, you know, um, did Marilyn Monroe have um, a nose job? Uh, you know, and so that, 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 that's very exciting stuff for a lot of people. So I can understand that, I do. I, I'm not putting that down, you know. If you, you know, life is short, you know, if that's what, uh, if you want to learn all about, uh, you know, Grace Kelly and Marilyn Monroe or something like that, it's great. Read People magazine. 
uh, but uh, if you really like to know something about the universe in which you live in a serious way, then these kind of questions might interest you. All right, so I think that ultimately what Josephus calls Essenes are the shakeout of this split. And if the Dead Sea Scrolls are Essene literature, which most people say they are, then they represent this pure Sadducee tradition. And if we look at the scrolls, that's what the sons of Zadok they call themselves. But they don't mean by that people who are going to uh, play ball with Seleucids or Romans. They mean like Christians mean a kind of righteous priesthood. Isn't that right? So they're, they're purest Sadducees. So they're not Sadducees of the New Testament kind. They're a, pre, they're a precursor of Okay, where did the Maccabees fit into this? At the time of Judas, I think that's what they are. Maybe there's some uh, slippage later on. By the time you get down to John Hyrcanus. And the slippage probably continues into the next generation. We'll see that in um, Josephus. But the slippage, I think, always relates to relationship with foreign power. How they treat foreign power. Okay, I think we've done it. So now let's go on then. Okay, that's why this moment is so important. Uh, what's the outcome of all this? These people are slaughtered. They learn their lesson. When Alchemus 25 saw how strong Judas, 725, Maccabees 1, and his supporters had grown, he realized he didn't have the strength to resist them, and he went back to the Seleucids. Then we have all kinds of uh, struggle continue to go on. Uh, problems here with the temple here, and uh, I haven't read this recently. The day of Nicanor, which is what Maccabees 2 um, ends with. Maccabees 2 ends here. It, with the celebration of this day of Nicanor. And it's when Nicanor's head was uh, hung from the uh, someplace outside of Jerusalem. He was the governor that was sent. Huh? I don't forget what happened here, but anyway, it's not so important. So, in any case, uh, now, chapter 8, Judas is corresponded with the Romans. Uh, Judas hears about the Romans, have a great reputation for military strength, and their benevolence to everyone. So by this time, the Romans are still considered, at, at this point anyway, the Romans are considered positive. Notice, Philip, king of the Kittim in my book, Perseus, king of the Kittim and others, the Kittim here are the Macedonians in, 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 uh, in um, Maccabees 1. Daniel, they were not the Macedonians, they were the Romans. So that's another problem I'll have to keep uh, thinking about. Uh, I wanted to get this quickly before I uh, go on, because I want to finish this book. You can read the rest of this book yourself. I think, you know, the military campaigning, you can certainly read yourself, like I'm going back now. Um, for instance, we have here the death of, um, well, let's go back. We have some battles here in chapter 4. Where's the death of this other, with some successes here in, in chapter 3? Look at this, 319. Victory in war does not depend on the size of the fighting force. It comes, heaven is where the, uh, it comes from. And you know, all fighting generals have really, uh, use that idea and agree with it. I was just watching last night a, 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 a history of Napoleon, and this is exactly what he did. It didn't matter what his forces were or how, or how he was outnumbered. It was, you know, he would always hit the enemy very hard with a full concentration of his forces. This happened at the Battle of Marathon, too. It happens in almost every battle, unless it's a war of attrition, like the Civil War and the Virginia Front was fought, or the First World War was fought, but usually, you know, when it's a moving war, it's uh, it, it is this um, this enthusiasm that usually wins the day, and uh, if you like this belief from heaven, and uh, people thought Napoleon was like that. I was a really good uh, one on they had it on the public television on one of the Orange County or uh, LA station. I forget which one it was. It's really a good biography of him. Uh, I couldn't understand why anyone would follow this ludicrous looking person, but he obviously when he was young he wasn't ludicrous looking. He got, um, he got, um, 
he got, I wouldn't, I want to say, I don't know what the word is, when someone is corrupted or, or pulled down by a woman, <laughs> he began to lull in the uh, embraces of, uh, of a woman, Josephine, who had been a courtesan at the uh, court in, uh, in Versailles and knew all of the uh, tricks of the game, and uh, he slowly uh, deteriorated in his uh, you know, appearance from the, uh, what kind of wife would you call that when you're living a uh, indulgent life. You know? When he was young, he was really a uh, wild man, a like wild man. In any case, uh, forget that. Uh, so we have that, and here we have in uh, chapter 4, the dedication of the temple. And look at here, you know, after he uh, purifies the temple, they found the sanctuary 38, a uh, wild, a wilderness. The altar desecrated, the gates burned down, vegetation growing everywhere. Everything was ruined. They tore their garments. They prostrated themselves. They cried to heaven. Uh, do you think that's accurate? Uh, I think there may be uh, a touch of accuracy there. At least that's how it appeared to them. I mean, it was just a total wreck. Uh, and uh, look at Judas. He's, uh, is he behaving like a high priest here? So, something, some vice chair or high priest or something. He selects priests who are blameless and observance of the law, perfect. Priest would have the order of Melchizedek, if you like, to purify the sanctuary, remove the abomination, you see, the altar that had been built by the Greeks. And then the 25th month of Kislev, 52, of the ninth month, Kislev, in the year 148, they started to sacrifice, and that's how Maccabees 2 begins with the letter, proclaiming this a holiday. And Judas and his brothers and the whole assembly, uh, line 30 to 59, made it a law that the days of the dedication of the altar should be celebrated yearly at that time. Eight days. So this is exactly where Maccabees 2 begins, right? And now we see how this begins. That letter must be from uh, Mac Mac uh, Judas Maccabee or his uh, father. <coughs> is this, I say, why don't you doubt these things? I will doubt if there's something that looks doubtful, okay? Uh, but at the moment, it's pretty straightforward. I, I told you I didn't think that that was a proper picture of the Hasidan, so we will doubt if it, if it looks like we should. Look at line 45, I'm skipping here, of chapter 5. Judas assembled all the Israelites living in Gilead, which is um, uh, on the other side of the Jordan from Galilee out in Syria, Transjordan. A, a huge amount of people and brought them in back into the land of Judah. So he collects the dispersed but he's pretty vicious. He attacked a town, line 50, put all the male inhabitants of the sword, sword raised it to the ground, marched through the town over the bodies of the dead. Wow, man. You know, <laughs> he's a, he's, a, he's a certainly a pretty implacable. Put it that way. So you can read the warfare. Uh, I, I don't really think that um, it helps. I don't, you don't need my help. Uh, chapter 7, in this, where the Hasidans are mentioned, Demetrius takes over from uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. And he's much more reasonable. Uh, and, and then the renegades come and try to, uh, you know, get what they need. And then we have the proclamation of another holiday here. So we get two holidays here. That we don't celebrate this one uh, nowadays in... Uh, the modern world at all, the holiday of Nicanor. Uh, but uh, it's in your Bible, maybe some of you should celebrate it, but the point is I think it's connected to Purim. It's the day before Purim, I think, or the day after Purim. Purim is a holiday people, some people celebrate, so these are connected in the, um, I think in the Maccabees 2 it's called the day before the, the day of Mordecai, and the day of Mordecai would be the day of Purim. So. Now here is a, um, a letter, chapter 8, the Romans have gained possession of Spain. How did they get possession of Spain? They fought the, the, the Carthaginian Wars. This is the time they're fighting the Carthaginians for control of the Mediterranean, Scipio and Hannibal, if you've studied that history at all. So th this is the parallel time here. Um, and um, Judas sends a, uh, a letter to them, an, or an embassy, line 20. 
and his brothers with the Jewish people have sent us to conclude a treaty of alliance. By the way, is there any indication that the, uh, Judas is usurping anything? I mean, uh, does anyone object to his... Uh, his, his uh, doesn't seem to from this picture. So the idea that he's an illegitimate leader and that he usurped the high priesthood and all of this that you get in Density Scroll Studies is just so much uh, imaginary. Uh, well, except if John is trying to pr prove his legitimacy Oh, but that's the priesthood. point we've made here, but at, the, at this point in the book, there's no indication that uh, this is earlier than John. But well, it's coming from his tradition. Yeah, because if it's coming from his tradition, this is a history sponsor. I see. Yeah, but I don't see that that this behavior with Judas is, I mean, I wouldn't doubt that that's how uh, he's able to send embassies to uh, to Rome and places where I'm trying to say. I don't think there's any question here about uh, that he's popular. It's all uh, he was taking my point perhaps uh, too much to heart there. But anyway, look, he put a copy of this on, on bronze tablets. So important documents and treaties and things, a uh, record of peace and alliance are put on uh, copper or bronze. The Dead Sea Scrolls are, we found two copper, two copper documents. They turn out to be lists of temple treasure. Dead Sea Scrolls scholars say they're imaginary lists how could the Essenes or the scroll people have anything to do with the burying or hiding of temple treasure? Uh, uh, people didn't put imaginary things on copper scrolls. They only put things, they, uh, imperishable things on copper scroll. Very important documents. So that's just, this is the problem in scroll studies. People, for every uh, person doing it, there's a different view and people can convince themselves of anything. So you say, well, how do you sort it out? Common sense, I think, first of all. And, uh, you know, you just got to use, you just can't accept everything you read, uh, uh, including what I say. You have to use your own common sense. And I hope I'm using common sense. I may be not. Anyway, uh, Demetrius, chapter 9, doesn't like all this. He sends an army here to avenge this uh, death of Nicanor. So Judas isn't so smart. And uh, Judas uh, falls in this battle. So this book is willing to, unlike Daniel and Maccabees too, talk about Judas' death. Jonathan and Simon took their brother and buried him in the family tomb in the tomb of Modi'in. So there's a family tomb in Modi'in, where they come from. Line 19. So then the, after Judas' death, all the renegades came out of hiding. And uh, things went, slid back from bad to worse. Terrible oppression began in Israel in 27, and a lot of strife develops. So finally, out of all this strife, Alchemus gets power in some way. Uh, by the way, notice there, they, 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 if I'm not mistaken here, Jonathan and his band, I never saw this really carefully before, are hiding out in the marshes of the Jordan River line 42. That's where John the Baptist is portrayed as uh, operating in the New Testament and that's basically where the Dead Sea Scrolls are found near the uh, in these uh, area around the Dead Sea and the top of the Dead Sea. Having this way avenged and full the blood of their brother they returned to the marshes of the Jordan. I didn't realize that the Maccabeans were hiding. Did you ever see that before? No, I didn't. No, I never saw that. So you learn something new even if you've read this 30 times, you still learn something new. So don't be disappointed if you feel that it's odd to you. It's odd to you, read it around 10 times. So Alchemist ordered the demolition of the wall, the inner court of the temple, 54, and this 153, whatever date this is, I don't have a footnote about that, but you can figure it out, I guess. His mouth became obstructed and he was paralyzed and he obviously had a stroke or something, and he died. So that was the end of that creep, according to this book anyway. Then Jonathan slowly, you see, does get chapter 10 support from the Seleucids here. Uh, pretender. And then in line 20, accordingly we have today appointed you high priest of your nation with the title friend of the king, and he sent a purple robe and a crown. Jonathan put on the sacred vestments in the seventh month of the year 160 on the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, 152 B.C. 
is what I have here. He then set about raising troops. So Jonathan gets the high priesthood, oh, about 15 years later. 15 years have gone by. You know, we haven't really got the feeling that a lot of time has gone by. And he gets it to an official point because he had supported one of the uh, pretenders, I guess. I mean, you can read this yourself. And now we have even a letter from Demetrius. King Demetrius to the Jewish nation. Blah, 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 blah. And it seems to be more official correspondence. And, um, but Jonathan also seems to be a, a, a local king, too. He puts on a purple robe and a golden crown, or sent him that to him. So he appoints him high priest and king. So now we have priest kings. Josephus doesn't, uh, he doesn't say that about, he says that a later Maccabean put the kingship on. Uh, the next uh, generation after John, uh, higher Conus, I think. But anyway, it looks like Jonathan here is already uh, functioning as both high priest and king. Now scholars, you see, because it didn't say that Judas was functioning as high priest, don't consider that Judas was a high priest. But when he was purifying the temple and appointing all these lower priests, what, what, what was he? Of course he was the high priest. You don't need appointment from uh, uh, the solicitor to be, I mean, because it isn't written he was appointed a high priest, they don't understand that he was a high priest. It has to be, like again, I told you about my mother. It's not written in the New York Times, you don't believe it. And, uh, uh, you know, it has to be, it has to be written. Well, you've got to use your sense. Yeah, he's a, he, he is a high priest. So, again, how do you know? It just, he's behaving like that. Anyway, Jonathan's problems here, and, you know, I don't have time to read all of this. Chapter 12. Jonathan, like Judas, has letters to the Spartans. So a lot of stuff from the Chancery records here, right? Right? And uh, this is a letter to the Spartans. Jonathan, high priest. So he's definitely a high priest. Seven of the nations, priest, the rest of the Jewish, he doesn't call himself <coughs> king, though. To the Spartans, their brothers. Greeting. In the past, our uh, St. Leonidas uh, wrote one of your kings, so he knows the previous correspondence, saying that you are our brothers. And um, we have proof of this. So he's sucking up to the Spartans here. And he's trying to say to the Spartans in Greece that line 21, it has been discovered in a document concerning the Spartans and the Jews that they are brothers and of the race of Abraham. Uh, so that's an interesting bit of correspondence. Then Jonathan gets killed at the end of this chapter through treachery. And a lot of people in scroll studies say that because they think that the wicked priest was killed at a banquet, which is total nonsense, there's no indication of that at all, but that's... I'll show you the passage when we do deal with scrolls on which that's based. They say, oh, here, Jonathan was, um, must have been eating here and must have been a banquet and he was treacherously killed. He must be the wicked priest. This is the kind of, this, this passes at Harvard. This passes at Oxford. This passes at the École Biblique. Thinking on that almost infantile level. You say, well, here we're at Cal State. Aren't we in the school of infantile? In, in, in? Uh, in infancy here? Well, yeah, but I don't think we think on that kind of infantile level. So uh, you can't be impressed by names, titles, institutions, where someone comes from. Maybe in hard science you can, but not this field. Not this field. You know, the very fact that someone would think that this, because this person may have been at a banquet when he was betrayed here and murdered, that that means that he's the wicked priest is like, I mean, you'd have to be a complete imbecile to think that. And yet people like Franklin Cross of Harvard and others like that propagated theories of that kind. Maybe that wasn't, you know, people like my colleague Vermesh at Oxford and people who criticized me around me, et cetera. This, these are the kind of theories that they propagate. It is uh, something that, uh, you, you, it is almost staggering, yet your Penguin book will be translated by Vermech and so on. So you say, oh, this person must know what he's talking about. No, he doesn't at all know what he's talking about. <laughs> Not at all. And uh, he, 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 he. So uh, the, the quote in question is, and uh, just as he passed the cup of trembling, basically, uh, an allusion of the prophets, to the righteous teacher, so too he will drink 
the cup of the wrath of God to its dregs. What it's talking about has nothing to do with a banquet. They don't understand the literary metaphor. It's talking about divine vengeance for having killed somebody. And it's using the cup imagery that you find in the book of Revelation. I can show you the exact imagery in the book of Revelation if you're interested. Those of you, I know, I'm sure a lot of you know that because it's a famous passage about the uh, about drinking the cup of uh, of vengeance uh, in Revelation, I should say. I don't know if I can find it quickly. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here it is. The second angel followed, 14.8. Babylon is fallen. Usually that's Rome. Babylon the Great is fallen. Babylon which gave the whole world the wine of God's anger to drink. There it is. A third angel followed, and all those who worship the beast or have themselves branded on the forehead will be made to drink the wine of God of the of the fury of God, undiluted in the cup of his anger, and fire and brimstone. And so that's the whole imagery of the, what we're talking about in the scrolls, and they don't even see it. They think it has to do with a banquet. <laughs> a banquet of divine vengeance, perhaps. So anyway, the wicked priest is not Jonathan, I can assure you. Uh, the lightning would strike me dead if that were the case. I would not, I don't have the slightest worry about it. In any case, uh, it's a total misconstruence of what the material said. But this is why I'm having you read that, so you can evaluate these theories. Because if you don't know the documents, how can you evaluate the theories? You follow me? Now you know what it's based on. You've read the document, you know what happened to Jonathan, so you can decide. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that um, Jonathan is. Um, is, uh, I think, he's, isn't he being held captive or something for a, for a bit there? He falls into his enemy's hands. And uh, then, um, uh, I think there is, I don't know the exact passage here, um, but he wants uh, some, some ransom or something. And Simon sends him Jonathan's two sons or something like this. Uh, can you give me the passage here? And that's really odd that Simon uh, Simon allows Jonathan's uh, children to be killed with their father by doing this. Even um, even uh, you know Giscard. No, what's the guy's uh, the president of France? What's his name? Chirac. Jacques Chirac wouldn't send the hostages' children to the hostage set takers. <laughs> that would be uh, you know even a person as uh, totally corrupt as him wouldn't do that. So that leads you to wonder, how, how, how would Jonathan do this? How, how would Simon do this? Is this correct? Is it Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan? I, I think it probably has something to do with uh, they contend for the throne. Well, yeah, we, we conclude that. Yeah. But the point is, I'm looking for the actual passage where it says that he did that. Can you anyone find that? It should be around chapter 12 or 13. Do any of you see that? You've read this more recently than me, you guys. Come on. Well, anyway, when you find it, we'll look at it because I don't. It's not jumping out at me here. It, the verses where they killed the sons. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, 16, 16. Oh, we're in the wrong. Okay, so let's see. Maybe I'm. Uh, so let's see. Fifteen what? Six. Fit, sixteen, sixteen. Sixteen, sixteen. Oh, that's no, really that's Simon's. Sorry. Well, maybe it's maybe I've got this wrong. That's Simon's. Uh, Oh, okay. So I've got it wrong here. So it's 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 Simon's sons. I've got it. I thought it was Jonathan's sons. Okay, I'm here. I'm here. Whose sons are these? Simon. Okay, and who's and and and, and uh, who sends them in then? Ptolemy and his. Uh, yeah. Well. Anyway. So uh, when Simon is son, so here's another banquet scene. Simon and his sons are drunk, and, and I, I, I didn't realize that the, both of them get murdered here. So maybe it's John Hyrcanus sends them in. Anyway, I, I'm a bit confused. I uh, take it back, so I couldn't find that. So uh, it wasn't Simon sending Jonathan's children in there. It was, um... oh yes, he did. Here, you're wrong. It's 1318. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, you're going to get me in trouble here. <laughs> I don't put a sentence. Guy's asking for money. Although Simon was aware of the message was a he sent the money and the boys. 
that is Jonathan's son, for fear of incurring the hostility of the people, who would have said that Jonathan died because Simon didn't send tribes with the money and, and the boys. He therefore sent both boys and the hundred talents, but he broke his word and he did not release Jonathan. And that's, so I didn't realize that Simon's sons also get killed at some, but not all his sons. But anyway, this is how the whole thing gets transferred to, to Simon, because Jonathan is killed with both his, um, his heirs. Now what about Judas Maccabee's sons? At one point, it does say Judas uh, settled down and got married in uh, this book here, if you're reading carefully. But it doesn't talk about any offspring. Uh, theoretically, if there had been any offspring from Judas, uh, they would have had uh, some priority. In any case, line 25 of chapter 13, yes, here we go, kills, I want to mark this, Jonathan's, I'm not going to fall into this trap again here, sons, okay. Hey, you guys are supposed to have read this more recently than me. I'm supposed to be a, you know, I'm supposed to be a lame duck here. You guys are supposed to be on top of this. I want you to know this better than me. You've read it more recently. Okay, so Jonathan, uh, Simon said, recovered the bones of his brother Jonathan and buried them in the, in the tomb of the ancestors in Modine. He raised up a monument with seven pyramids facing each other. Very nice of him, but still, from that moment on, Simon is the, uh, is the uh, only one left. And look here, line 49 and 50, 51. The Jews made their entry into the 23rd day of the second month of year 171, carrying palms, like Jesus in the scripture, harp, cymbals, zithers, singing. And Simon made it a day of great rejoicing. And he took up residence in the, on the, in the citadel. And his son John had come to manhood. Simon appointed him commander of all the forces. So John now is the, and now maybe the other sons of Simon get killed, but not John, you see. So John is the one who's left by the end of all this. And we assume this is um, the history of how John uh, became uh, the legitimate heir. Um, more honors for Simon, chapter 15, 14. He stood firm, like his father had said, fought off the enemies of Israel, and this is an inscription on bronze tablets, more bronze tablets, set on pillars on Mount Zion. On the, and this is the copy of the text. On the 18th of Elul, 172, Simon the great high priest. And the assembly, so he's also high priest. Simon, son of Mattathias, a sin of the line of your Yarab. There's your Yarab, line 29. The first priestly uh, course. Confirmed the high priestly office by the king, line 39. Named the Jews friends and allies. Simon was the perpetual leader and high priest until, line 42, a trustworthy prophet should arise. So I would assume that in uh, New Testament eyes, and perhaps our own, uh, John the Baptist is that New Testament prophet who is going to appoint a new high priest. Once the Maccabean family has uh, been destroyed by the Herodians and the Romans, all the people consented to grant Simon the right to act in on these decisions. And he assumed the high priestly office by acclamation, actually. You see. It doesn't say that, but that's a military commissioner and ethnarch of the Jews. And this is also put on bronze tablets. So all these important things are put on the copper or bronze tablets. And uh, Simon's titles are recognized, you see here. And then chapter 16, John went up to Gezer. And uh, so John is by the end of this chapter uh, the ruler. I was confusing the, the Simon's death when he was um, uh, killed by treachery at a banquet with Jonathan. So I don't even know how they get the fact that Jonathan was at a banquet too because most of these scholars like to think of Jonathan as the wicked priest, which I don't see any indication that that's the case. Okay, that's the end of Maccabees 1. I took a little too long, but I thought we should go through it, right? Not just skip through it, over it without telling what's in the book. Now, you can read it in more detail, right? And I'm sorry, I, I got off this topic in the beginning. I take me a little bit of time to, to get into the material. I'm cold like this a week off. So we'll go through uh, two Maccabees after the break, and we should go faster. And uh, then we'll start Josephus also. 
and next time we should go through Josephus, the time after that we should go through Josephus, and the time after that we should probably have a test. So if you want to know when we should have a test, probably three weeks from today we can have a test, but we'll talk about that. Okay? See you after the break.